Hello everyone and welcome to today's Adam Deep Dive session. My name is Professor Chris Bain. I am the uh, Professor of Digital Health at Monash University here in Melbourne, Australia. I know we have a number of people registered for today from not only our state, Victoria, our country, Australia, but also around the world. So um, we're really excited to, uh, to have everyone join us today. Um, Basically, the topic we're touching on today is optimization of EMRs, how to get the most of them. This could be from a point of view of uh, good workflows, of good usability for clinicians, of good access to data, of improvements in quality of care for people. Um, any, of the, any of the audience who've worked in this space know that that's actually quite a challenging thing. Uh, these systems are worth a lot of money. Um, that's an unavoidable cost of doing business in this space. But with that money does not come a guarantee of um, ultimate value and benefit. So today we're gonna to have multiple experts from around our state, from three of the large health services in our city, talk about these issues from a really interesting combination of perspectives, uh, clinical, technical, administrative, and, and mixtures of those things. So just bear with me as I move through a few um, uh, introduction slides about um, our work at Monash, and then I'll hand over to our speakers once I've introduced them. So firstly, I'd just like to perform an acknowledgement of country, just to acknowledge that I'm uh, on the lands of the Wurundjeri people today. I respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional owners of the land on which I'm sitting today, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. A little bit about Monash University. For those of you who aren't from Victoria, uh, Monash is arguably the first or second university in Australia based on size. We have something like 80,000 students. Um, we have a number of campuses in our state of Victoria, Clayton being the primary campus. Um, but we have a presence in many other countries. We are truly a global university, um, a long-standing Malaysian campus. Uh, but also a new Indonesian campus and some satellite facilities and partnerships. Um, our faculty of IT, from which we run the digital health agenda, um, also has links into a couple of places in China and strong links with the Indian Institute for Technology in Mumbai, and particularly with their new Koita Centre for Digital Health. And I'm hopeful that we have some of our colleagues from the Koita Centre online with us today. Um, Adam, um, as in Adam Deep Dives is our Alliance for Digital Health at Monash. It's a vehicle for engagement out of our faculty across the university um, and into um, other, our other country partners, but also into our health industry. So we have multiple Monash University partners of Adam. Um, we also have partners who are in the hospital system. And a number of those um, have provided of the speakers today and the expertise you'll hear about today. Um, and it's a vehicle for us to really engage broadly on that really complex and interesting area of digital health. We have over 400 individual members in Adam, and this is one of the um, functions of Adam is to highlight some of the expertise across our membership. Um, we have a number of key topics that we like to work on. Um, we clearly will work on all sorts of things, but these topics have particular resonance in the local area, but also into surrounding regions such as Malaysia. And the topic we're touching on today is the one on the far right, electronic medical record uh, optimization. And the reason being that um, EMRs are being rolled out across Australia increasingly and into even into other countries. Um, but we're relatively behind in our journey if we compare ourselves to places like the US uh, and some parts of Europe. Um, with that comes both an opportunity to learn, but also um, some of the challenges we find are still unavoidable for us, even learning the lessons from others, because the systems aren't the same, the health systems aren't the same, and some of the uh, clinical requirements are not the same. So I'm going to introduce en masse our speakers today. First three speakers are all from uh, the intensive care services area at Eastern Health. Uh, Associate Professor Owen Rudenberg, who's the Clinical Director of the ICU at Eastern Health, is the first speaker. Owen uh, uh, is the Director there, and Eastern Health is one of the largest health services in Australia. 
He is also an associate professor and adjunct associate professor with Monash University. Owen is passionate about high quality medical education, training, mentoring and research at all levels within and beyond intensive care. And Owen has been involved with the team implementing the first full CERNA intensive care module in Australia at the Box Hill Hospital, which is the main hospital in Eastern Health. And he advocates and advises government and private industry on engaging clinicians in data acquisition, quality documentation and utilisation of clinical data for patient benefit. We'll then move on to Mr Stephen Hirth. As our second speaker, Steve is a data analyst in the intensive care services at Eastern Health. Um, he uh, has had that role for the last five years, working closely with Owen and people like Graham, who you'll hear about in a minute. Steve is also an adjunct lecturer in, at Monash Uni in the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences. Steve completed a master's degree in IT in 2004 and has specialised in health data and information roles ever since then. So nearly 20 years experience in this space. Just bear, me as, bear with me as I move my screen around a fraction. Um, our speaker after that will be Associate Professor Graham Duke, who's also a Senior Intensive Care Specialist at Eastern Health. Um, Graham is also a former longstanding Director of ICU Services at Northern Health. Uh, which is also here in Melbourne. And that's when I first heard of Graham as a medical student sometime in the, the late 80s. Um, in 2022, so last year, Graham also joined the Victorian Agency for Health Information, or VAR. He is the Data Analytics Fellow, bringing his vast experience as an ICU practitioner and researcher who support the development of VAHI's analytics cap uh, capacity. Uh, Graham's role at VAHI includes helping to design and report mortality measures, especially uh, HSMR, which is a very valuable um, tool and approach. He also advises on developing reporting for critical care and other safety and quality outcome measures, including hospital acquired complications. And we've um, had some conversations with Graham on that topic specifically. Our speakers after that will be from different health services. Um, next in line will be Mr. Robert Dashwood, uh, Robert joined the Monash Health Project Management Office as a Senior so Digital Solution Architect in 2022, bringing 15 years experience in digital health. He is a, what's called a CHIA, a Certified Health Informatician Australasia, and an Associate Fellow of the Australian, Australasian Institute of Digital Health, which is our peak professional body in the Australasian region. He is also TOGAF9 certified. Uh, for those who don't know, that's an open... Uh, I'm going to make sure I get it right. The Open Group Architecture Forum qualification about uh, systems architecture. From 2018 to 2021, Rob brought CERN's suite of EMR programs to Monash Health, digitally transforming the entire documentation process and greatly boosting efficiency. And I'm sure there were some hard ones, lessons from Rob that we'll hear about as he speaks. And our last speaker, but far from least, is Dr. Stephanie Wood. And Stephanie is from Alfred Health. And Stephanie has a really interesting background that's highly relevant to this topic. She's a, a fellow in medical administration and, uh, and clinical informatics. And she focuses on effective and appropriate use of EMRs in the delivery of patient care. She has previously worked on many EMR implementations and projects at other health services in Victoria, including Eastern Health including the, um, the full stack, if you like, EMR out there in 2017. And she also participated in future state consultations for the Monash Health EMR project. Um, she's currently completing the specialty training with the Royal Australasian College of Medical Administrators. And Stephanie aims to bring medical leadership and management to the field of digital health. So I'm just going to keep this slide up for a minute or so. This is um, a preemptive slide for the audience. You can see my email address there. Um, if you can foresee yourself wanting to get in touch with uh, ourselves or the speakers after today, um, then feel free to please contact me. I'm happy to act as a conduit and um, guide in order to reach our speakers rather than them all be bombarded individually. But we will, of course, have about half an hour of um, group discussion once all the speakers have finished. So plenty of time to address your questions. You can um, enter your questions into the chat 
oh, sorry, the Q and A function in the Zoom, and we will um, answer them as we move through the session today. So let's begin. I'm now going to stop sharing, and I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, who is Associate Professor Owen Rudenberg. So over to you, Owen. Uh, Owen. You're on mute currently, Alan. Terrific. All right. So hopefully you can see um, a slide there in front of you. Um, it's great to be with you, and it's um, and it's a privilege to be able to share some of what we do. I'm a director of intensive care. I'm a clinician, and I look after patients. But I also am really passionate about enabling people and enabling people to get stuff done and create meaningful um, connections at work. And that's part of the way that I lead, but it's also um, what brought me to the EMR journey. So I'm going to step you for the next sort of 10, 15 minutes through um, a little bit of the background to what we've done at Eastern Health. And then I'm going to hand over to a couple of my colleagues to give you a bit more of the detail of what I'm talking about. So to start with, um, uh, uh, we have a team of people at Eastern Health, and I started at Eastern Health some months before the implementation of the CERN EMR module or the product, which was the first full one in ICU um, in Australia. And so it was a learning curve trying to un-Americanise some of that and trying to make it all relevant to what was going on here. But um, there was a whole lot of things that that were not necessarily very evident in what's needed to bring clinicians and an EMR together when you're used to dealing with um, a paper-based system. So in front of you, you'll see there's Graham on the left, myself on the right, and in between there's a, um, a, a few people, two of whom are actually ICU nurses or by background who were part of the implementation expert team from the EMR team here at Eastern Health, and who is absent from that in terms of this um, um discussion is uh steve who you'll hear from next because he didn't uh he wasn't part of our team at that stage and that's really critical to what we're talking about so i'm going to just check that i can advance this slide so let's just start off with the idea about what it is that we're trying to do today and that is to work at how we can optimize the utility of emrs particularly as clinicians and often we then come up with the idea that what we just need to do is get the best out of the data that's in the EMR. But as most of you will know that if you put crap in, you get crap out. And so the question is, how do you get good detailed information into an EMR that allows you to then get the most out of it? And that's really where the focus is here. And if you don't want to listen to the next 15 minutes of my talk, then the one key thing you can take out of it is that the answer to getting the best out of the EMR is also um, putting the best into it. But the converse is also true. Um, to put the best into it actually means you have to start getting something out of the EMR, and that's what I'm going to be talking about here. So as a historical way of thinking about this, if we think about the clinicians who are working in our hospitals today with our patients today, many of us trained in an era where we dealt with paper records and um, dealing with data was simply about dealing with the, the, um, the information that existed in the clinical relationship. But in fact, it wasn't a core part of what we did, nor how we did it. In fact, it was a small part of what we did. Most of what we have as clinicians is an identity, which is tied up really importantly around a patient and around a patient benefit and a patient relationship. In fact, historically, the documentation for that was purely really as a record, if you like, to support the work that goes on between the clinician and patient or the clinicians and patient. Therefore, it was more like a, a legal document that, that you might think about with a lawyer that is really a confidential, protected, privileged document, which essentially is there to record this private conversation and interaction and relationship between a patient and clinician. And in that paradigm, the clinician is expected to be the expert and the owner of the information that comes into that communication between the patient and the, and the clinician. And, and therefore, the treatments with that paradigm 
are really individualized, but they're based on the knowledge and the expertise of the clinician based on published evidence. And therefore, the documentation, which we used to think of in those um, colorful paper um, uh, note stacks that you saw in the previous slide, was really just to support that. And what we learned through our clinical training was that we had to make it a legally appropriate document. It had to have the date. It had to be signed. It had to have the designation of who was writing and recording the document and um, and what their designation was. And therefore, it had to contain a comprehensive document of a documentation of what your interaction was at that time. The intention for the use of that information was for the future interactions with that patient. There was no expectation that that information would be used to inform other interactions. And in fact, under that paradigm, when we wanted to do some publications, when we want to actually develop the medical literature to help us to manage our patients, we actually had to invoke a secondary data source. And we still do this today, it's a hangover, but we still, uh, what we had to do was we set up a database we set up specific data recording for the purposes of the research that we were looking at, and that was recorded outside of the patient record. That was the historical paradigm that existed. And that's the way that we all trained and um, things have changed. So this is my life on a slide. Um, in the last, uh, in my life, we've seen that structured data has grown massively. And in fact, now we've got recorded unstructured data, which is now exponentially um, um, growing. So in that time frame, we've moved from having paper documentation to having the capacity, as Chris alluded to, with great expense of all types, um, to actually record huge amounts of data for the patients. But if we think about it, I don't know if you can see my mouse on this slide, but all of the people who are who are trained and working as clinicians, trained in an era really where there wasn't a lot of data available and that the expectation was we were dealing with recording a legal document. In fact, the people teaching at our training institutions for clinicians were very much uh, currently still trained in this, in this sense. So we don't see that data and seeing patient information as data is actually core yet to our identity as clinicians and our understanding of um, what our document actually informs. And so fundamentally, we are um, looking at it through an old fashioned lens and then trying to apply that very broadly to the way that we do an EMR. And not only are we doing that, but we discovered when we did research over the years that when you had multiple people recording data, the quality of that data was impaired. In fact, the best way to get the best quality consistent data was to have an individual who was entering the same data. And we've moved from that to an expectation now where every person from the triage nurse in ED to the ward clerks, to the um, physiotherapist, to the um, doctors and the nurses and the uh, medical students are all data entry people. And all of them have pretty limited training in the tools that we provide them, them with. And yet we're still expecting the same performance in terms of data quality and being able to utilize this because we haven't trained them in the context of being of thinking with the lens that what they're entering is data. We still are training them in a way that helps them to expect that what they're doing is entering a private document which is protected and is about them and the patient. So then how do we move from that paradigm and how do we do that at the same time as implementing these really powerful, expensive, cumbersome systems? And that's really what I'm talking about here, because it sounds like too big a task and it sounds like a task that um, is therefore the reason why we, why we should shy away from it. But I would argue that the very thing that we must do is embrace that change and actually help our colleagues to understand the benefit of embracing that change. But fundamental to that is seeing that what they're entering in here is not a legal document about a patient relationship, but is actually data. And whether you frame it in those words or not, that's essentially what we're talking about. One way to do that is to come at it by looking, we've found, at what the patient's expectations are in this. And I know from um, my own expectations and my own experience with family and friends and others that 
in all walks of life, our expectations are that our data is being utilized for our benefit. So when I go to many stores now, I don't get a receipt because I know that I'm signed up as with them and that they will keep a receipt on their system and that I know that I can go back to them with the product that I purchased for them if, from them if I need to because they've got a record of that on their system. I'm expecting that. I'm expecting that the very data that I'm contributing to will be there available for my use recorded by them in the future. And we have that same expectation by our patients and consumers now. And yet we don't necessarily comply with it for a whole number of reasons. We don't actually give them the advantage of maximally using, using their information to inform their own care, let alone the care of all of our other patients who might in fact look like them. So we're now looking at, at this through the patient lens and saying, well, if this patient information should be, should be available, how are we going to do that? How are we going to make sure that it's quality information? How are we going to utilize that to inform our next decision making, either for them or for others? And how can this um, clinician relationship actually help the patient? At the same time, that data and knowledge increase that we saw on that exponential slide before is true of our information that we have as experts. No longer can we expect the doctor to actually own all the information in their head. We're now seeing that the role of the clinician here is to actually guide the partnership, guide the relationship with the patient with the use of what's available um, in the real-time uh, world. And I don't want to simply limit it to what's available in the literature, because I think historically we've re relied on the literature, whereas now we're coming to a point where, where consumers, where patients are actually expecting that we're relying on the very data that we collect in our own organisations. If we see a thousand patients in the, in the last five years with a um, with a pneumonia in my context, a pneumonia that needs them to come to ICU, then shouldn't the data around those thousand patients who needed invasive ventilation in ICU inform the way that we manage the next patient that comes in with pneumonia in our ICU? And with the tools that we have, with the expertise that we have in the context that we have with the, um, with the um, consumers and the um, community that we have. And therefore, shouldn't we be able to individualize treatment for the next patient based on the best data available to us, including the very data that we've generated in our own system? And in this paradigm, the documentation is not just about a, um, a relationship and just about a private piece of information. It's truly about data. So how do we migrate then from this idea or this paradigm where we're thinking about a legal document to where every member of the team is a data entry person. One of the challenges with this paradigm is that this is actually an onerous task. We've not necessarily trained people well to do it, nor have we equipped them with more time. And in fact, if we look at this um, model where we simply say, this is all we need to do, we teach them to do it and tell them this is now their job, then what we see is that it has a massive impact in the negative on the very team that we're using. So this is one source of, um, of uh, survey material, but this has been repeated over and over again in multiple countries and in, and in multiple ways. And um, what this um, shows is that if we look at the um, morale and meaning and purpose that goes with working as a clinician, then, and this is for doctors in this study, but the burnout has become a, a, a word that we all understand. The causes of burnout that you look at here really come back to these bureaucratic tasks and EHRs or EMRs. Um, if you look through this list here, EHR and IT tools hurting my efficiency, EHR or IT tools inhibiting my ability to develop quality care, um, a lack of a whole lot of training and proficiency in EHR, a lack of tools and support. These are themes which, which recur many, many times through many, many studies. It's now reported that it's one of the highest, if not the highest cause of burnout, particularly in the US, US um, that an, an EMR. And that is partly because what we've done is we've actually asked people to do something which is not perceived to be of any benefit to them and to their role and to the patients that they're serving. And so as such, there's a huge burden of non-valuable effort that is actually uh, harming the, the clinicians that we're doing. Not to mention, that I mentioned before, that what that probably leads to in many of those circumstances, if not all, 
is a lack of quality information because if what you're doing is just a required but unhelpful thing, then what you find is that the attention to detail and the quality of that data entry is actually impaired. So how do we turn that around and make that beneficial? I like to think about this kind of model, which is pretty simple. If you look at Dan Daniel Pink's um, concepts that he talks about in Drive and, and a number of other sources, these are these are not unique to, to him and his concepts, but they're nicely packaged up in that book. We're talking about the things which actually help people to thrive at work, or if you like, help people not to want to leave their job or their profession. And those things often come back to autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Those things that actually feel like we're valued, the things that make us feel like we actually are good at something, and the things that make us feel like we have a sense of control over our own work. And when we think about telling people who are clinicians that they're now data entry people for some other benefit, realistically, that actually undermines all three of those um, areas. What we're really wanting to do is to um, think about if we use this model and think about how do we get people to change the way that they think about data entry, we're really wanting to make this a meaningful exercise for them. So how do we make these clinicians who are now old dogs, old school, old world uh, um, um, clinicians, how do, we, how do we make them want to do this so that it's a benefit to them? And, it, and, and we've discovered painfully that it's not about telling them to do it because that doesn't work. What that's doing, in other words, is undermining their motivation. It's actually an external motivator. Usually it's about compliance and usually that actually is experienced as, as disempowerment. So what we're really wanting to do and what we try to do is we actually, uh, we actually try to frame this in a way that gives people a sense that this is something of benefit to them. And I've just mentioned there that it isn't and it hasn't been taught by our professors in our professions because they trained, as I mentioned before, in an era before this was actually the way that we think about data. So I'm going to finish up in a second, but what we've done here from a practical perspective at Eastern Health is to recognise right early on that we were not going to get that transformational change without waiting several generations of clinicians to think properly about the use of data. And it was clear to us initially that if we simply gave them the minimum mandatory EMR training, what we would get is five, 10 years down the track, a whole bunch of really redundant bits of inconsistent, incomplete, inaccurate data. For example, uh, we discovered that very early on when we put the EMR in, all of a sudden we had no smokers in our patients in our ICU. And historically, smoking is a big risk factor for a lot of conditions that bring people to ICU. And the reason we discovered there were no smokers in there was because smoking was being recorded or was being reported out of a part of the EMR, which you had to click three times to go into history, social smoking, active. Um, and when you went into every patient's file note, you found that, in fact, that the physiotherapist, the triage nurse, the um, the uh, bedside nurse and the um, ICU clinicians on the home team had all documented that this was a 50-year-old, 50-pack-year smoker history, and um, that was all there, but it wasn't in the data. And so to, in order to bring that to people and make that meaningful, we put that data in front of them. And when we put that data in front of them, um, they suddenly realised that the information that, that, they were, that they were actually entering was important. The way that we've gone about doing that is to provide some tools that are not just based on their own training. So pivotal to that has been the incorporation of Steve Hirth, who I'm about to hand over to, to our team. We recruited Steve and we we're so blessed to be able to get um, someone of Steve's calibre to join with us. We love, um, we love Steve and we love working with him and he's contributed invaluable to our, our organisation far beyond the ICU because um, what Steve's done is he's under, he understands our work. He now understands all of the quirky intensive care phrases that come out of our mouths because he sits in the office just next to me here with the other consultants from ICU and he works in our team and he works on projects that essentially build the capacity for us to understand the very data we're entering, to be able to question it, to be able to expect that data is going to help us with the questions that we come up with. And he, and he does it in a way that enables us um, to grow our capacity to do it. And so he's going to talk to you a little bit about that. 
some of my other efforts have been very much around advocating for the organization to remain connected to clinicians because very easy for the IT part of this, for the EMR part of this to be separated from clinicians such that they think, well, the clinicians are busy looking after patients, we'll develop it, we'll come back to them. And what's really fundamental is that clinicians are still front and center of this. We talk about patient focus, but that doesn't happen if you don't put the um, clinicians into that conversation. And so the patient focus remains important, but we have to have clinicians in the in the mix. So the, the, the quote is that we can't predict the future, but we can aim to innovate it, or we can't predict the future, we can only aim to create it. It's been multiply attributed to Peter, to, to, to Drucker, uh, to, to um, ex-United States presidents, to um, ex-CEOs of Apple. Uh, what we do know is that data doesn't help us to predict the future, but what we're doing with setting up this um, clinician-based kind of engagement with EMR is actually helping us to create the capacity to do it better. So I'm going to hand over to Steve, and I'm going to flick through his slides so that I don't have to change this slide deck. Um, but Steve's come to us, fortunately, as I've mentioned, and we are um, really indebted to him for the things he's created. So what we've asked him to contribute today is some of the um, content of what he's been able to create with us. Thanks very much um, for your for listening to me, and um, thanks, Steve. Ah, thank you, Owen. I feel uh, much loved after that uh, little feel that you've given. Um, yes, so uh, I'm the ICU data analyst at Eastern Health. I'm not a clinician. I have no clinical background whatsoever. Um, Owen, as Owen mentioned, we were one of the first sites to uh, put in a full ICU module in the EMR. And Owen had the amazing insight to campaign to fight for my position to, to allow us to get the best out of that uh, EMR system. So we go to the next slide. Thank you. So this is a homage to my introduction to the ICU. I was welcomed with this poster on the corner of my office and, and an abacus. And uh, the infrastructure has improved significantly since then, but um, it's uh, it's not a, not <laughs> it wasn't that much better than that when we started, but we've come a long way. So I have a rather unique position. Oh, if you go back to that. I have a rather unique position where I am embedded inside the clinical unit, as I mentioned. So I'm, Seen as part of the multidisciplinary team, I'm I permanently located inside the unit, share an office with the consultants. And so my role and my brief when I started was to get involved with the unit, find something that grabs your attention and run with it. And so if we look back at that uh, Daniel Pink quote that Owen uh, mentioned earlier, it's definitely, um, definitely a... Um, a lived experience of having that autonomy, that mastery, that purpose in uh, in my work. Um, so if we think about analytics, traditionally we've got an analytics department that um, I call it like a factory model. So you would have a team of people where there's segregation of the various roles. So we'd have the business partners, we'd have engineers, developers, modelers, analysts, visualization experts, sometimes shared resources over there. But it's just a bit of a pipeline where you have people that have set skill sets and the work moves from one through to the other. And often in that environment, you've got to cater for the lowest common denominator. It's, um, it's, it's a situation where you're trying to um, meet the needs of an entire organization, so quite wide, it tends to be fairly shallow sort of environment. So my role within ICU is to be narrow, but a deep focus. And the approach that, um, is, as opposed to the factory model, is to have like an artisanal model where I'm involved in the whole process from the start to the finish. And uh, so that's uh, all those previous roles that I spoke about, uh, to tailor a solution that suits our specific needs. And um, often that's an experimental environment. So we're talking about what if this possible? Can we do this? Can we do that? So we have this um, 
in an environment where I'm engaging with clinicians, uh, building on top of those established relationships that we already have, and um, working through situations, working through issues um, in a collaborative, interactive manner. Because as I said before, I'm not a clinician, so I listen to them speak and often my eyes glaze over and um, they listen to me speak and <laughs> they, they tend to do the same. But together we can get some things done. And um, together we can get some things done. Um, if we um, just move on to the next slide. Thank you. So, when people think about an EMR in their mind, they think about that image on the left-hand side. It's typically you're looking at one patient at a time. Um, you're often looking at a, a, a patient that's currently in front of you. And it, the interface is, is like a, an enter and a read. Um, you, you're entering information in there. You're looking up information, that, that single patient view of the world. And this, there's some lists that help you do that and there's some charting abilities and some limited search, but it's really a single patient sort of focus in the world. Um, so while I spend a bit of my time in there, the picture on the right really represents my world. And this is under the bonnet, the back end of the EMR. This, is a, this picture is a um, small section of the underlying database that's behind our CERNA uh, EMR system. And um, that database contains around 6,000 tables, which is um, quite enormous, and currently using about 75 of those tables. Some of the key tables in there have over a billion rows of data, and, and one of our major tables grows by about 400,000 rows a day. And that data is coming from about 1,500 different users. So uh, when we're talking about trying to um, have consistency in data quality, you can see some of the challenges that we have. It's an incredibly steep learning curve to, to get involved in that, into this data. Um, um, but it's not a, it's, um, there's an online community that's uh, really been helpful for me to get involved in uh, understanding how we can take a concept that you can see in that front end, where is that data stored, how is that data stored, how can we extract that and verify that we're getting uh, accurate results. Um, go to the next slide. So I just want to talk about some of the ways that we're using EMR data in our day-to-day -day practices here in ICU. And the first one is not that exciting, but it's really important that that's auditing. And so what we find is that uh, auditing is a good way to gauge the quality of our data. So things like how accurate it is, is it complete, is it consistent, is it timely, is it valid? And so this is one of the ways that we're feeding back the data that's being entered back to the user group that has entered it. Um, we've got the ability to highlight potential data issues, we can identify gaps, and sometimes this sort of works will expose some issues in our workflows that suggest that maybe our, our um, practices need to be refined because things aren't quite happening. And then from here, we've got an opportunity to re-educate or reinforce or, or remind people around what they're putting into the data and how to be a bit more mindful about what they're doing. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So another way is to monitor some of our activity on our service. So here's um, two examples that I've put up here, it's a bit hard to tell, but um, on the left there, we've got a, um, a tool where we are monitoring the steps required between a patient presenting to emergency all the way through to when they're admitted to intensive care. We've identified seven data points that can uh, represent those steps along the way. And so using the EMR data, we can actually then 
uh, quantify those steps. How long are they taking? What's what's our median time? What's our uh, expected time frame? And we can take that data and we can compare that to what we're currently experiencing. So if we know that uh, one particular phase stage there takes anywhere between one to two hours and we're going four hours and we, we have a feeling that this is uh, a longer process than necessary. The uh, chart on the right there is looking at some of our medical imaging um, ordering. Um, and so what we can do is we can look at um, where the demand's coming from. So we can use our historical statuses of our orders to determine, A, what's the volume, how long do the particular steps take of the, of the orders, Where's our demand? So if we've got demand in hours, out of hours, weekends, weekdays. And so it's allowing us to understand our business more. Take off to the next one, thanks. Our benchmarking is another thing that uh, we do. Um, the chart on the left there is an old paper-based chart, which, um, we still have in use at two of our ICUs. And um, we, we submit data to an organisation called ANZIC, the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care Society, who um, maintain a database of over 2 million episodes of ICU admissions. There's about uh, over 100 data items that we submit for each patient, some renowned demographics and physiology, pathology, interventions, outcomes, diagnosis. And pre-EMR or in the non-EMR world, this is all derived from a paper-based system. So as you can expect, quite labour intensive, quite uh, um, error prone, and then a big trans uh, transposing issue. But um, since, order, uh, since bringing the EMR on at Box Hill, we have been able to develop a process to extract that data that's collected just as the standard basic care of, of a patient in intensive care and extract that data to generate a file to submit to, to our, um, our benchmarking facility. Um, we can do some local validation on that file before submitting it and we can do some trend analysis to see if we've had any uh, changes in practice or maybe even changes in our documentation practice. Um, and during the uh, COVID, we, we traditionally um, send data quarterly to our benchmarking, but during the COVID um, surge last, last year, year before, we were required to send weekly data updates to inform the, the government and the health department around what our ICU capacity is in the COVID surge. And so having that process and having that ability to automate that data directly out of the EMR allowed us to significantly turn around that, uh, that data in quick time. Um, next slide. The cohort analysis, and I've picked one example here, but we have this ability now to take the data that's in the EMR and analyze it from multiple different directions. So this is um, looking at one of our services, which is responding to medical emergencies within the hospital, it's a service that uh, ITU are responsible for. And so we've developed a reporting tool now that allows us to look at trends over time, see where our demand is, what's the peak times of the day or the, or the evenings where our calls are coming from, why we're getting met calls, what's, what happened at the met call, who attended, and ultimately what was the outcome. And so this is a, a reporting um, tool that's been rolled out across the whole organisation. And so it allows the various specialties and, and wards um, to filter for their particular areas to see what their response is. This has allowed us to um, identify a couple of things. The first one was that 25% of our MET calls were for hypertension, low blood pressure. And of those, 
of those calls, 40% of those patients received either IV fluids or no interventions at all. So it's all of a sudden giving us a bird's eye view of our, um, our activity in this, in this space um, and informing us uh, to, to see whether there's a warrant to change of practice or a change of protocols or whether any preventative action can be taken. We've also used this to highlight that um, our demand for our service out of hours where we don't have uh, particular staff on site. And so with, this is um, being used to justify um, uh, business cases for in, improved um, resources. And we go to the next one. So this last one here is um, looking at patient analysis. And so we had a situation where one of our consultants um, generated the chart from the left on, from the EMR and then spent many hours annotating it on the right there. And basically wanted to know, is there anything we can tell about our patients that would, um, is there anything that the EMR can tell us to help us better understand what's happening with our patients. So if we go to the next slide. So by extracting EMR data and presenting it in um, other ways, we've been able to provide insights that you can't get from the EMR. Um, a lot of this information here is um, derived from raw values, so it's not information that's um, available in the EMR in its calculated form. So we're actually using EMR data from many different areas, clinical observations, medication, ventilator settings, laboratory results. And we're coming up with um, a trend that allows us to look at what are the interventions happening and then how is that impacting on this patient care. Now, as a non-clinical data analyst, I have no idea what this chart is telling me, but it makes sense with the clinicians. And this is a classic example of how working together, we can uh, achieve some, so much. Um, so just to wrap things up, um, that's some of the things that we've been able to achieve so far. It's, uh, it's early days, we've come a long way, but we've, we realise we've got a long way to go and uh, learned a lot of lessons along the way. So hopefully, We've set ourselves up now for future success. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, we're going to rapidly move on to Graham Duke. I'll just um, remind all the audience participants, feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, any specific questions for individuals, we can pick up and then anything left, we'll discuss at the end. But uh, over to you, Graham. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and welcome to everybody, and thanks very much for the time. There are so many other people at uh, Eastern who could fill the shoes, and uh, I'd like to just acknowledge the support of so many people. Owen's mentioned a few of them. Uh, Hamish Rodder, our Chief Medical Informatics Officer, is another person who's just been phenomenal. And you can't do this without a team, as the saying, uh, or to plagiarise the saying, it takes a village to raise an EMR. Um, in uh, next slide, Owen. So, um, in really expanding on um, just some practical uh, ideas that Owen and um, Steve have alluded to. One of the things is you would expect that doctors would always document an admission and a discharge summary for each patient. What we realised is that wasn't always occurring. And one of the things Steve's been able to do for us is just generate a dashboard similar to the one he showed you before, but just shows us how often in ICU we do fill in a, an admission and a discharge summary and when it's done and when it's missing so we can um, follow up on those. And why is that important? It's important because it's a jurisdictional requirement. In fact, it's a national requirement for hospital accreditation that we uh, document. And it's one of those things where we uh, it brings us to reality. Our perception was always, oh, doctors must always fill, a, fill in a discharge summary. Whereas when we actually had a look at reality, that wasn't the case. Next slide. 
And another example that uh, we've recently uh, discovered is that uh, we need to document uh, the duration of time the patient's on a mechanical ventilator. And we thought that was being done reliably because uh, like Owen alluded to, there are places, specific uh, fields where that information should be entered and it wasn't being entered, it was being entered elsewhere. And so we've initiated through being able to look at the data and documentation to say, we need to improve that and develop a system to be able to educate the staff. And that's an ongoing one. And as Nikki, whose uh, photo you've seen um, in the previous slide, uh, said, it's amazing what you uncover when you actually go and have a look. Next slide. One of the other things we did way back at the start of the EMR was decide to put in an automated clinical alert. And I won't go through the details because of time, but basically what we found was the alert was a great idea. First of all, it was needed to be redesigned in terms of its data definition because it was based on an old or um, out, um, an outdated definition. But we, we revised that and put it in place and found that whilst it was telling us uh, mo some of the time when patients had, uh, in this case, severe infection, and if you have a look at the Venn diagram at the top right-hand side, it just shows you the results that we found that the sepsis alert and the possible sepsis alert, the blue and the red circles, did overlap the true um, cohort of patients who had sepsis or severe infection in the green circle. But there are a lot of false positives and uh, a lot of false negatives. And so we realized that um, uh, it's important to test these systems and to validate them before they're implemented. Next slide. Another example uh, alluded to is the complications. So we extract out of the um, uh, the progress notes um, a lot of coding data about diagnoses, and a lot. And some of these are being used nationally now to audit complications. And it was based on the assumption that complications were unexpected when the patient uh, arrived at hospital. There are unplanned outcomes that occurred because of suboptimal treatment and resulted in increased loss, uh, length of stay and cost to the patient and to the taxpayer. And we're, an in, and we're an indication of system failure. When in fact, we had a look at the data in the next slide, what we found was in fact in 95% or more of those occasions, those comp so-called complications were actually expected events that were identified by the clinician and, and uh, resulted in the decision to admit the patient to hospital. The patient did receive optimal treatment and the increased length of stay and the cost was actually the thing that uh, was required in order to bring this patient to the best outcome and reduce further complications. And uh, this was a measure of a system success. Um, the ability for us to uh, rescue patients when they uh, they fell over um, and not due to suboptimal care as was thought. Next slide. So, um, and finally, I think it's the, the emphasis that I'd like to get across is um, that the data that's in the EMR is really powerful, um, but the problem is it's ambiguous, it's agnostic, and we need to use it very wisely, like um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, James Bond uses his uh, ammunition in his Walter PPK. Next slide. And so finally, my comments are that the EMRs to us has been really important for driving research. It's helped us dispel myths and false perceptions and uh, enables to see reality. The things that I would emphasize is that we need to keep it, the uh, research projects nice and simple to start with. And you want simple, clean, comprehensive data, not large, muddy, uh, unreliable data sets. It's really important to understand the metadata behind the data that Steve's alluded to. There's the table structure, the definitions that are being used for the data that you access. I've emphasized uh, just very briefly the importance to clinically validate anything that you extract, particularly in a research environment out of the EMR. And 
it goes without saying that none of these things that we've been talking about um, and outcomes would be possible without the expertise of um, so many people at Eastern Health, uh, many of whom uh, go unmentioned, but particularly, you know, the staff who enter the data and Owen's alluded to how important it is to get accurate data. Then the uh, data scientists, data analysts like Steve, who enable us to be able to extract that data, um, clinicians with that expertise like Hamish, who I mentioned before, is a wonderful resource and I encourage you to contact him if you want more information about our um, EMR. Then the, the importance of having both the expertise in statistical um, analysis and also the clinical insight to make sure that the, the outcomes are robust, meaningful and uh, can help prove, improve patient safety and quality of care. So thanks very much and I'll hand back to you, Chris. Thanks very much for that, Graham, and thank you to, to um, Owen and Steve. Um, we're going to move to a slightly different perspective now. And we please, um, as we've said, please enter any questions you have in the Q&A. Come back to some really interesting things raised by the folks from Eastern Health in a second. But um, uh, um, Robert, who's going to speak now, is coming from quite a different perspective. Um, and also from a different organisation, um, obviously still with a focus around EMR. So I'm really keen to hear what uh, Rob's got to say. So over to you, Rob. Uh, thanks, Chris. And thanks um, for, for the guys from Eastern uh, in front of me. And I, I didn't collaborate with Owen, but he actually laid some groundwork for me, which is um, great. So hopefully I can capitalise on that. I'm a solution architect from the program management office at Monash Health, uh, distinct from Monash Uni, but we are very, very close uh, to each other, at least on the, the Clayton campus. I started in health information management 20 years ago and have spent um, at least 15 years on various digital health platform implementations. Um, and a good chunk of that are Cerner implementations. Uh, one of them, the Eastern one, I was there um, in 2017 when it went live. Uh, and but. That Cerner experience has given me a lot of exposure to the Australian public system uh, and various applications that exist across the, across the board. Uh, today, my presentation is going to be based in the, the TOGAF framework, which I'll, I'll get to explaining, and, and Chris did a good job of uh, remembering the acronym um, up the, at the beginning. Um, but I'll also sh share some anecdotes. Um, the examples I, I use are actually real things that have happened but they could have been avoided uh, with a little effort expended sort of early on at the start. Um, and a bit of scene setting, I, I think I see the EMR a little bit more broadly than um, others tend to, um, because all of the clinical applications in your organisation amount to your EMR in my um, point of view, not just the really expensive US vendor version that uh, the clinicians might use to document in um, day to day. Um, an EMR can't really be an EMR without the patient administration system, the RIS, radiology information, uh, LIS, cardiovascular, um, without the business intelligence, which clearly um, Steve uh, has a lot of his hands in, um, you know, your pharmacy information system and everything else. There, there's so much more. There's there's even the billing that comes out of EMR data, um, but is managed in a, a different system. So I lump all of these together when talking about optimization. And those optimization initiatives are more than just app configuration and um, and tweaking things and, and doing a bit of training. They're, they're complex change initiatives that can affect many systems. You know, change in one impacts another. If you're going to change the way you collect data over in the EMR, it's you've got to have an equal reflection um, in, or impact to workflow perhaps in another one of the systems downstream. Um, and I think the a lot of people's uh, stories, anecdotes, and even the evidence shows that implementation of an EMR is just really the first step. It literally opens floodgates to opportunity and possibility and, and demands. Um, people like the clinicians just before me talk about how they want to use their data and what they can get out of it and good data in is good data out, et cetera. Um, seeing what a digital hospital can do actually really opens everyone's minds to what could be working better. Um, so my topic is actually gonna focus on 
not on EMR governance, although that is a really important topic that I um, think we, sh we should have a, another topic on, Chris. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about business requirements and how they're an essential part of any optimization process um, beyond just um, the configuration, the setting up of, of that project. Health services are full of really intelligent um, and clever, dedicated people, and they have ideas. Lots and lots of ideas, uh, great ones, good ones, awful ones. And some of those uh, people have idea, um, political power, some don't. Some are basement coders um, in, their, in their spare time. Um, I think we might count Hamish Roder from Easton as, as one of those. Um, and some have a whole workforce working for them that are pulling their hair out because of system incompatibilities and copying and pasting something from here to over there just to make something work. Um, and some of those people with ideas have really powerful vendors whispering in their ears, telling them, oh, yeah, I can do that for you. Just get me in the door kind of thing. But few of those people with ideas have the ability to define their needs in a way that enables effective solution development, i.e. EMR optimization. It's not really their specialty and nor, nor should it be. Um, so for example, when infection prevention, um, and this happened back in 2020, says we need to do an assessment on every patient that comes in the door to screen for COVID risk. You shouldn't immediately launch into developing a brand new EMR form and make it mandatory on every admission, um, particularly when it turns out that all they wanted to do is actually hit certain cohorts in certain locations with certain presentations. And back in early 2020, that assessment actually amounted to, have you recently returned from China? It really did not require a whole EMR uh, form and rule and um, development to sort of hit every clinician on every presentation with, with that question. And um, just before I move on to the next slide, I kind of want to do a shout out to requirements.com for getting such an awesome URL. I, there's a website just entirely dedicated to business requirements, which I thought was pretty funny. Anyway, I've got a twisted sense of humour. So as mentioned, I'm, I'm certified in the Open Group's um, architecture framework or, or TOGAF. And this is a framework intended to align an organization's architecture objectives to support their strategic business goals. And it originated out of um, technology initiatives, but as a framework, it can kind of be applied to any initiative that you wanna do. So you could use this to plan your wedding uh, if you wanted, but it might also speed along your divorce. I'm not sure. But a core tenet of this um, framework is the architecture development methodology. And I'll try to be brief and, and bring it to my point, point pretty quickly. Um, but this goes through a series of phases, um, this ADM architecture development method, um, where we look at what is the vision? So basically saying for this optimization, what do you want? What do you wanna get from this? And the next three kind of repeat themselves, but what we analyze is the business environment that we're working in. Who's doing what, when, where, uh, how big is our service? What is our service? What capabilities do we have? Do we have an ICU? Do we have an ED? Do we have uh, a pharmacy? What, what is part of the mix here? And then we layer the application environment on top of that and ask all the same questions. And then the technology stack. So, you know, what kind of infrastructure do we have that we're working with? Um, for opportunities and solutions, now that we know all of those things before this, what can we actually do to achieve this architect architecture vision? We then look at, now that we know what we want to do, how are we going to change? How are we going to get from our current state to our future state? And, and what are the pathways of, of transition? Um, implementation governance is all about quality controls and making sure that what we're getting is what we want and, and bringing it back to that. And lastly, the architecture change management is monitoring how is our change progressing and what are the, ch um, do those changes prompt new initiatives that we need to do in the future? So, yep, we fixed this thing. Does that now open something else up for us? 
And ultimately, how are we going to embed the learnings, the documents, the artifacts from this process back into our framework to allow us to build on it again and again? But what I've skipped here is what's in the center, the requirements management. And this is really, what do you really want? Business requirements are actually really hard to ascertain. Um, they're hard to write and they're hard to get right. If you don't understand business requirements, then you can't adequately do the next steps, the application requirements, the technology requirements. And then if you can't get any of those right, you've got no chance of determining, well, what are we actually changing here? Um, so the business requirements support the entire methodology. They tell you how you know that you're gonna get what your users want, um, how you know you're achieving your goals and how you hold your vendors to account. You can put them in your contracts. Um, you can use them to assess the performance of your team. You can use them to assess the quality of the project that you're undertaking. Um, and I think probably most people in IT now um, get this comic, right? It's a pretty bad old joke now, but it represents the failure of effectively determining and agreeing what your business requirements are. It's a whole different series from lots of different perspectives. It's not what we asked for. It's not what we need. It's not what you paid for. It's not what you delivered. And I've been in these conversations. I'm sure many of you had a, have as well. Um, I thought you meant this. It's not in the contract, blah, 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 right? All of these things happen in real life when we don't agree and um, write down what it is that we're trying to achieve. So, why am I banging on about this to this group and, and in the context of optimization? Um, you can go and Google what good and effective business requirements are. So I won't go into detail on it here. But one of the most important things is that they're um, un unambiguous business requirements. And that's not an easy task. So that clinical workforce I, I was talking about, and this sort of builds on what Owen was saying, they're not trained to describe you know, IT business requirements. And um, they, they're trained to do other things um, and they, they shouldn't be trained to do this. Um, I doubt most of them have been through a course or a process of having to define business requirements, nor do they necessarily know that they need to. It's, it's a project management thing that should be taken care of um, there. But so what that means when you're doing EMR optimizations as, as a project manager or an executive um, or manager of, of any part of this process is that you need a really trustworthy workforce or trustworthy consultant who can translate your clinical vision into requirements. And then if you can lay them over the top of your business environment and then the application environment and then the technology environment so that you can adequately define what it is that you're gonna change. And so here is where I'm going to talk about what happens when you when you don't do that and you either you break the process and do it do it backwards, you define things in the middle, you don't sort of go beginning to end. Um, so you get the executive telling you, I told you, I told them we deliver our solution in three months. And my response is, well, wonderful. What is the solution? How do we know it's going to take us three months? What if we need to replace hardware? What if we need um, a whole new, to engage in a new vendor we've not worked with before? Um, we've seen a business manager who's, who's, who's just said, hey, we've already picked a solution and the vendor, all we need you guys to do is install the service. And our response was, well, this vendor actually has a really bad reputation for delivering late over budget. And we're not even sure they're the right pick for, for this. Um, do we know if the software is fit for purpose? Can we even, do we have the staff in house to support it? Um, and has it, has it met any of our cybersecurity controls? None of those questions had been asked. Um, we've had the infrastructure guy who, um, he goes, hey, look, we've got some spare network attached storage and we've hooked the server up to that. How good is it? We're basically doing this project for free. And our response, well, that's wonderful, uh, except that um, the business requirements dictate the clinicians need a lot, a high, massive amount of image local storage that allows them a faster interaction with the, the data that they're looking at. 
So the network attached storage is not going to fit the bill. Um, another, ex I've, I've talked to vendors, right, who clearly do not know anything about HL7 or integration. And they're like, yeah, 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 we can do it. Don't worry. You know, we've got it all covered. We've done it before, or we've got a guy, but they don't have a spec and they don't can't tell you how they'll solve that problem. And, and possibly they're just saying what we want to hear to get themselves in the door. Um, and then they'll work out how to deliver on that later on. Well, similarly, we've had, um, we've had citizen developers and, and that's a wonderful thing, right? Lots of people want to solve their own problems and, and that's great, but you also need an environment that allows them to bring that to work. So, so we had someone de design a great power app to automate their process in the lab. And they just, they're like, all I need is a server to install this on. I, I built it on Ubuntu at home. Um, we're like, we don't support Ubuntu and we don't have the skills to do that. Where Windows shop, it needs to be running on that. And you've got to re, um, retest your platform on, on a Windows environment in order to proceed. Um, and possibly my favourite of the, of the COVID era was the Department of Health um, telling us that we needed to start reporting all vaccination data in hospitals as of the 1st of July, 2021, uh, except they told us that on the 8th of July, 2021. So, you know, ill-defined business requirements can really spell um, big problems for how you go about solving the problems in front of you. Um, so wrapping up, um, what my message uh, in terms of uh, what we're here talking about today, you know, the common challenges of EMRs, best practice for optimization and engaging training key stakeholders. Train your people how to describe what they need. Um, so, you know, I want a swing to be made of wood and suspended from a tree, but then also train them how to elicit good business requirements. Well, what kind of wood? How many ropes? How far from the ground? Um, train your people what good requirements look like. And then actually use those requirements to agree on what your design is, to hold your vendors to account, to make sure, hey, I'm buying this off you. And when you deliver it, I'm going to test your product against these requirements. Uh, get your governance engaged and caring about requirements and compliance. Um, yeah, I get they can be really detailed, really boring things, but it is important that they understand why they exist. Um, and ultimately keep them uh, as in a repository, make them available for the rest of your organization to maintain as an artifact of this is what this is what our product does, but then also to modify and reuse in the future when you want to build on top of that again. Um, so my view really is if you've got the skills and the workforce and the right framework to, to build up your requirements um, and define them for your vendors, you'll be starting your optimization projects with a massive head start to the, to the group who are just agreeing on something over email. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. Thanks, Chris. Um, back to you. Thanks very much, Rob. Well, lots of juicy, contentious stuff in that. That's good. <laughs> um, I love the, uh, the the graphic with absolutely no luck required. A um, lot of hard grunt in getting IT right. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Stephanie Wood. Uh, Stephanie will talk to us from yet another quite different perspective, and then um, we'll get into our panel session later. And please keep the questions coming uh, in the chat. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you. And just to get the nod, if you can see my screen, just checking. Uh, can do. You're a little faint, yeah, Stephanie. <laughs> oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? That's up. a bit better, yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, yes, my name's Stephanie. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction and um, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I am here talking about clinical governance in EMRs and particularly the challenges and opportunities. Clinical governance may not sound like a particularly fascinating topic. I know if you told me when I was in med school I'd be in a desk job talking, giving talks about cl clinical governance, I would have laughed. But here we are. It's something I'm passionate about and I hope um, to make it interesting today. I think it's a really important area in EMRs. Uh, I'd like, I'm going to talk about why it's important, why it's particularly challenging in this area and um, some future directions for this. Um, so, 
for announcements. So just to start with, I'm not exactly sure the um, audience today, but some basics, what is clinical governance? So if we look to the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare, so the keepers of uh, all our national standards, including our health service standards by which all of our hospitals are accredited, standard one is a clinical governance standard, and it um, says that clinical governance is a continuous improvement of the quality and safety of services, uh, which should be patient-centred, safe and effective. And with that um, definition, why should we care about clinical governance and EMRs? Well, I really hope that's quite obvious. Uh, patient safety and quality is um, incredibly important to everything we do. And the thing, though, is that we in the EMR space, I challenge anyone to say that it's the first thing they think about when we start looking at optimising EMRs. We don't think, oh, we've got to put a new tool in, oh, what should we do around clinical governance? And to understand why that is, um, I think it's really important to look at the evolution of medical record, right from the paper days. So in paper, in the last few decades, we've moved from systems where we have very form-based, pre-text, very manual um, systems. The onus, as Owen was talking about, the onus is on you, the user and the, what they write in their you know, pre-text notes. Over the years, we moved to a hybrid system. We have scanned medical records. We have um, Stephanie, you've frozen on us. So I'm not sure if you can hear us. I'll just give you a little while to um, see if you can between hear. electronic systems and paper and so um, we're still not we still weren't quite in an electronic era but we are moving or have moved in a lot of our health services in Victoria to these really comprehensive electronic medical records which are more than just a record they're intelligent systems they're dynamic there's clinical decision support and we're not working in these discrete um, packets with, with discrete packets of information. There's a focus on that entire patient journey now, not even within an admission or an encounter, but across encounters as well. And so as you can see, we've moved from simple systems to complex adaptive systems. We've moved from looking at paper as, or medical records as adjuncts to our clinical work to really being crucial embedded parts of the clinical workflow itself. So if we think about clinical governance um, in that context, uh, and we look again to the Commission, their national model clinical governance framework, sorry, that's an apple. Um, clinical governance is just one element. Um, so hopefully making world well happy that we're talking about governance, but it's just one domain of uh, an entirety of corporate governance. And traditionally or historically, digital health governance has sat in another one of these circles in corporate governance in this Venn diagram with a little bit of overlap, but still as two distinct things. And so when we think about the way that um, electronic medical records or the medical record itself has evolved, and now that it's so much a part of what we do, not just an adjunct, as I said, how has clinical governance evolved to meet the needs of these complex, uh, comprehensive EMRs? I would, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say not much. Um, we've really changed medical records. We've really changed the way clinicians work. But um, we have really largely stayed the same in a kind of separated um, Venn diagram. And um, I can demonstrate this again when we look back at our national standards, so not just the hospital, the health service standards, but across the leaves of the nine national um, standards from the Commission. And as you can see, one of them has the word digital in, in it. Um, none of these really focus on digital health per se. And the one that is does say digital is really in its infancy. It's not completed. It's in development. Uh, national health service standards up the top there. The eight, there's eight of them and they make superficial, perhaps passing um, references to electronic medical records and um, you'll just have to take my word for it, the clinical governance um, standard uh, where it does mention medical records is mostly talking about the My Health record. Similarly, this is from um, 
the Australian Digital Health Agency, which is a um, national body for digital health. Again, these are their four, four priority areas. My health record, electronic prescribing, telehealth, provider connect Australia. And so you see the EMR doesn't make an appearance there. And to Rob's point, I know not everything is about EMRs, but if we're talking about hospitals and the way we're moving, the way we work, a lot of what we do is in the EMRs. And why do I make all of this point? Well, as you might be able to see, uh, while looking at me on the screen, bar for the glasses, I really uh, connect with this character in this Disney movie because representation matters. And so if we are not, uh, as people who work and really live in this space and EMRs and EMR optimizations, if we um, don't have a seat at the table in these high level frameworks guidelines, it does have a trickle down effect um, in everything we do. So in the absence, I'm just aware of time, in the absence of um, having a uh, clinical, well, some good clinical government standards that are specific for us in digital health or particularly in EMRs, I'm going to take this, uh, this is ADHA's clinical governance framework for digital health that was released this year, not that long ago. This relates to, they related it to themselves. So this is for, to be applied to the, um, to the agency, but I'm going to use this as a framework for looking at where uh, our clinical governance challenges are in optimising EMRs. So you can see here on the right, uh, figure three, they've put five clinical governance principles and I'll work through each of these. I'm going to start with um, partnership. So partnership in this uh, framework is really talking about code aligned with users and with, um, uh, with um, clinicians is really what we're talking about here. And we already heard from other panelists about how important it is to work with um, users. And uh, co-design is typically pretty great during the EMR projects. It's really exciting. Everyone's engaged. Everyone's looking forward to this next big thing. Um, we have subject matter experts. We have working groups. We have people thinking about how they want to work in the future. Um, and, uh, but what we see happen is with established EMRs is that we kind of lose all of that momentum. We end up being reactive and um, it's always kind of in response to things um, being asked of us or going on. Users are less engaged um, just as a at a baseline. They're used to using the system. They're not thinking about how to improve all the time. We spend a lot of time uh, reacting to directives from above. So doing things um, like we saw very much in COVID, the Department of Health would release a new guideline and we just had to put something in. So there's much less focus on that human factors design that we all um, love and would love to prioritize. And again, thinking about the tool rather than the clinician workflow. And again, Rob talked about this just before in his talk about how in COVID um, people just jump straight to asking for a, um, a form in an EMR without actually thinking about how it's going to fit in their workflow, who needs it, when, where, why. Um, and I'm just going to leave you see this is a whole topic in itself and I know someone else has touched on this as well, but this, un this idea of clinician builders when we're talking about partnership you know, there are a lot of, um, particularly, the, I know there are a lot of my colleagues, doctors who are out there who have um, IT, who have coding skills, but we really don't know how to leverage that to maximise the potential there. And there are a lot of uh, quality issues that you have to think about there, safety issues, you know, what responsibilities do they have? What's their remesh? How, what's the decision making there? But I think that's a talk in itself. I just want to reference this um, paper that a colleague recently sent me, which I thought was really interesting. It's written by some people at Google and it's kind of coming from the other, um, other side of the coin, which is a large tech company looking at how they built a clinical team during COVID. And what I think is really interesting is um, some of the lessons that they've learned about how to work across and within these teams. Um, and unwittingly, I think they've sort of written a clinical governance uh, framework or guideline for, um, for EMRs that we could use in our work. 
And this figure here is showing the engagement with their clinical team members over time. And they're showing that as they matured in their model and their thinking and their ability to incorporate um, clinical um, teams into Google, they've moved from over here, the lesser engagement of being largely about ad hoc advising with a bit of consultation. And they've really moved over to this more meaningful engagement where it's about collaboration, and then at the highest end, co-creation and leadership. And something that struck me when I looked at this is I kind of think this, this is the inverse of what happens at hospitals when we have EMR projects. We go from this massive, huge uh, engagement and um, linking in with clinicians um, and building things and designing workflows and you know, your future state reviews and all this stuff. And we sort of lose that over time we go backwards. So how do we maintain that engagement? Um, the next um, item is really looking at this leadership, I think, is the next um, principle that I wanted to talk about, which is uh, leading with our people in this ad hoc framework. And the first question is, what does this look like? Um, we, you know, informatics and EMRs, we're all, it's really in our infancy still in Australia in particular, in thinking about what leadership is. Um, there's this tension between existing clinical governance structures and new models of leadership. Uh, you'd see, I'd say most um, health services, public health services, are implementing an EMR. Once the EMR is over, they tend to absorb the uh, decision making and the governance into their existing committee frameworks, their um, directors and um, program heads, departments, things like that. And we're not really sure where where this gap is, but I do think there's a gap um, in leadership here. And uh, just turning the mirror on myself a little bit, I think this is a really important role of clinical informatics. Um, and I've said there, who are our people? You know, this is a very new area of, in terms of a profession. These are people who I would say should be our um, next leaders and who are, have the capacity and the ability and the skills to bring together clinicians and um, our technical teams to really um, create space in this area. And just uh, referring back to this uh, article again, but I won't go into detail, but they um, described five key accountabilities of clinical team members in a clinical team at Google. I think this um, really well summarises what leadership in clinical informatics should look like. Uh, but here's the time I'll just move on. Um, so the next uh, principle that is evidence-based practice that I'm going to talk about, and I think this is probably the, the uh, area that we do in, in which we do the best. And I think part of this is because it's the most easy to understand and to apply and to consider as the role of an EMR. Uh, evidence-based practice in an EMR comes into form, so um, allergies at um, uh, the entry of allergies and allergy checking in alerts, uh, clinical guidelines and um, clinical decision support. And this is probably in order from, you know, us doing the best with allergies down to still developing in terms of clinical decision support. But the there are challenges in these areas. Um, so one is, and I know everyone talks about alert fatigue and user expectations, but um, and it's incredibly important, that's why we talk about it, but it is a clinical governance issue because if you've got alerts uh, firing all the time and um, no matter how meaningful they are, if users start to ignore them, then they lose the impact and they lose the ability to actually influence quality or safety in the system. So there's no point alerting someone to a penicillin allergy if they've seen that a thousand times and they're just close the window anyway. Um, there's, there are challenges around standardisation. So we just recently reviewed our alert guideline in the organisation which I work and um, we put it in and that's great. We have a lovely tiered framework for alerts. But I guarantee you if I went down the road to my colleagues in another health service, they'd have a different um, set of rules for alerts and when things fire, when pop-ups are presented to users. And particularly in an environment where we have users who 
rotate between health services who work in different health services. Uh, it's again, comes back to those user expectations and saying, well, what is important enough from a clinical perspective to have an alert for? Um, clinical guidelines um, are challenging because uh, how do you keep the information up to date? So in the paper system, we relied on, and Owen spoke to this as well, you know, we rely on the user to uh, go and check clinical guidelines and use that to uh, influence their um, practice, their documentation. But if we've got clinical guidelines embedded in an EMR and they're then out of date, what's the impact then on the patient care that we are delivering and on the quality of care? And similarly, um, this brings up as well challenges around ownership and accountability. This is with guidelines and with clinical decision support, you know. So if we have um, if we have medication ordering and a particular antibiotic is promoted, but that the algorithm on which it's based is now out of date, um, or you know, there's a new guideline out, and in reality you would have picked a different one, but the doctor, the prescriber, you know, went with the decision that was presented to them. Who owns that? Where, where is the EMR in the ownership of that decision? What is the accountability there? Who are the, where is the responsibility? So again, all of this, I would say, there are a lot of clinical governance issues, challenges in this area that we're still um, we're still sorting through. The so the second last um, uh, principle here is system safety and quality improvement. And I think this is a huge. Just a huge, and I think uh, some of the talks today really spoke to this, this is a huge challenge in EMRs, in optimising EMRs. And this cartoon here says spring cleaning is just replacing winter clothes with lighter, more colourful ones. And a lot of the time that feels like what we're doing um, with EMRs. We uh, want to improve something, we kind of just replace the old with something new that um, uh, in a bit of a rotation, but we never really cleared, cleared up the mess. And so what do we do currently from a safety and quality improvement perspective? Or what should we do for quality and safety? So currently we prioritise business continuity. So optimizations come in. Uh, some examples of this for, you know, uh, we will prioritise the ones that mean that we just keep this, the organisation as service ticking along and making sure we can um, deliver and of course, that's important, but that always takes precedence over actually improving things. Um, so really for safety and quality, we should be not just looking at business continuity, but improving our patient care, you know, optimate, putting the optimizations first that um, have the biggest impact on patients. We also produce small scale solutions when asked. And I underline solutions because we're very solution focused. So when optimization requests come in, we look at them and we think, well, this is what would fix that. And we also do that, you know, it's very reactive. So we wait until we're asked for it. And we say, someone wants a new referral for, you know, service X. And that's what we deliver. But we don't think, well, what's the actual problem here? Do we have a problem with the way we refer? Do we not just need to um, address this one services request, but could we improve things across the board and have a new way of working? Um, and just to touch on here, which because I don't have an opportunity to talk then, but, um, you know, in... Um, in our EMR projects we go through, we have these great design principles we come up with and um, recommended workflows and design documents, and then we kind of forget about them, really, and we just focus on the small scale. Um, where am I not up? And currently we focus on data use for reporting and, and research, which, again, very important that um, reporting, typically, you know, for reporting, we're always looking back. Um, we're looking at what are our KPIs, what do we need to uh, produce a report for and send it out. When, and even though I did, you know, Steve had a really great example of using data use for improving clinical workflows, but this is not the norm. We don't um, look forward, we tend to look back. So what we should be doing is when we're designing things, looking at 
well, how, how do we build this in such a way that we will then get the right data out of it afterwards? Why is, and I'm going to try and speed up a bit, so why is it QI, quality improvement, EMR optimization so challenging? So we have a, an impact from a lack of standards, as I spoke to before. We've got external pressures, so there's tired pressures, workload pressures, there's so many optimization requests that come through, everyone's is the most urgent. Um, and demands only increase as COVID um, showed as well. And there's a really poor understanding. So we're still acting like we're in a paper world. Uh, the understanding goes both ways. Um, Owen had a point about the quality um, in use, that quality in using EMRs in di is difficult. The users aren't trained in how to actually put in quality data in the first place or why that's important. Um, and people have uh, unreasonable expectations about turnaround times and things like that. And then the last, um, the last principle here is person-centeredness. And in looking at this, I just wanted to juxtapose this against the, uh, the commission, the Australian Commission's um, clinical governance framework, and just the difference, and it may be plain semantics, but if you look at the difference in this one, we have partnering with consumers right in the middle. And in our digital health one here, we have person-centeredness around the edge. And I, I do think, though, this reflects the difficulty we have in involving patients in optimising our EMRs. It is one of our national standards in itself. It's really much easier and better where patient involvement is really obvious. So patient portals, my health record, it's easy to see why patients should be at the front and centre of that. But in EMR optimization, um, I'm going to just leave you with a big question, which is what role does the EMR play in the patient-clinician relationship? So um, I can just, just quickly summarise So I've talked about a lot of, you know, frameworks and standards and things like that. But to me, clinical governance and optimising EMRs comes to two main questions that we should always be asking ourselves, which is why are we doing what we're doing? and how can the EMI improve patient care? Um, there's challenges, I've got some, I might just run through them because they're, I'm out of time. Um, and I'm aware of it. So um, opportunities to improve clinical governance in EMI um, optimization. So representation, as I spoke about, we should have, um, we should be, starting to write our standards as if we are living in a, an electronic world. Um, leadership, in particularly in clin clinical informatics. Um, engaging clinicians in problem solving for optimization, not just with, with them at the end when we need a solution. Uh, reframing the, participant, uh, the patient as an active participant in EMRs and shifting the focus to looking ahead with for quality. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephanie. That's been very helpful. And it also relates, uh, interestingly, to both the clinical examples that um, the guys from ICU have mentioned early, but also technical perspective that Rob mentioned. All of these things are important. All of these things need to be brought together. Um, thank you to everyone who has asked questions and thank you to our panel members for answering them um, in parallel. Um, if anybody who asked the question doesn't feel like they got a good answer, you can always post it again and we'll, we can talk to it now. There's a question here now from Anne-Marie, which I want to put to the whole panel. Um, so um, what, if any, have been some of the changes to training for clinicians to support them and improve their understanding of EMR documentation and accurate capture of data? Anybody talk to things they've either done or seen? might relate to some of your messaging here, Owen, as a start. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I, I don't know that we've nailed the answer, but what I've seen is the challenge is that when you um, put an EMR in, the initial recommendation for what you need comes from the EMR provider, and that's true of all of the systems. And what they then put before you is essentially the full smorgasbord of all the suites of their, you know, of their things, including their implementation plan, and then what happens is that comes at a cost point 
And then what happens is there's a negotiation about what we can trim so that we can make it affordable because, of course, it's not. And unfortunately, the thing that's seen to be um, dispensable in that negotiation is a whole lot of stuff that comes to this point. And that includes things like all of the coaching, uh, both in terms of the tools and personnel that are required to actually upskill clinicians to take on this entirely new philosophical and, and, and operational task, as well as the ongoing um, training. So in other words, you get an upfront little package, but there's nothing a year down the track when you actually now know how and why it's relevant that that then refines how you enter it. So there's a whole, so the Cerner suite that we use has a, has a capacity to actually monitor and feedback the use of individual users, group users, and to be able to choose outliers and actually demonstrate to individuals how their performance in using the, um, the tool might be improved. But that tool requires someone to use the tool and someone to then coach the individual users. That's quite possible. Unfortunately, that's a cost which is often dispensed with right up front, and it certainly was in our place. So that that I've seen used overseas to quite some success, particularly where um, in the US where the workforce is much less cohesive. You know, much of the medical workforce in those hospitals is largely privatised. They're not necessarily. Um, engaged in the same way that our sort of full-time um, staff are in this um, context in Australia. But the other side of it is that, and that this is the sort of the cheap end that we've been working on, because Steve's really cheap, um, is to try and build tools that are relevant to clinicians. In other words, when we, um, when we before we had Steve, in, in order to get a report from our own organization on any data we had to submit a request. That request was a couple of pages. It was not um, we didn't know what we wanted to know, actually. And then that request then went in a queue and some time later we got given a report, but it didn't match what we needed and we never used it. So it became, if you ever did it, you did it once and then you realised it wasn't going to be helpful and you wouldn't do it again. What we've tried to do is make Steve really in demand because what happens is people get responsive um, and iterative design such that they can actually see the value and they work with Steve and in the end they get a product that helps them and then they come back with more questions that build on that and then that that has helped us to to help clinicians to see that what they're entering is relevant and um so that's sort of what we're the way that we're dealing with it thank you Owen um Stephanie do you have a perspective on that question from Alfred and this yeah time? I think that well, I, don't, I think it's just a general comment from um, about this idea about capturing data. And um, one of the things I always say is that clinicians are smart people and they are going to um, do what they, the, you know, take the path of least resistance to take care of a patient. Right? So if they don't see value in entering something in an EMR, if it doesn't present well, obvious value to them, they won't do it. And it's not out of malice and it's not out of, you know, not wanting to do the right thing. It's just, as we all know, very busy. My priority is the patient in front of me. So I think what we need, what we should be doing there and hopefully we're trying to move there over time is, as I said once, we should be building in a way that presents value. I think that's where the actual issue is. We build it in a way that makes people want to enter it because they can see they get something out of it. If we could solve that for everything, it would be wonderful. But um, to Owen's point as well, you know, one of the issues with being able to provide that is that the value is often down the track. So if I say to some, you know, an HMO is really, really busy on the ward, please put in all this data on this patient because in two months we're going to want to audit their outcomes, you know, that that's not meaningful enough for them if they've got someone creating the next award over. So um, my answer is we need to find ways of embedding value in the workflow itself and making it meaningful for people to use um, the, the EMRs in that way. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let some of you ponder the next question from Sophie while I say a couple of things about it. So 
Sophie's question is, can you comment on the development of standardised clinical terminology in Australia? So I'd ask you each to think about your local experiences of that more than anything. Um, I would just say to Sophie, I guess it, that's a really complex question. There are um, lots of frameworks for using and agreeing on standard clinical terminology. Um, they're used all around the world. They're used in Australia to different extents. There's all sorts of reasons why that may not have permeated onto the ground as much as is ideal. If we look at our Victorian context, for instance, each and every hospital is in a position fundamentally to make its own decisions about its clinical technology, let alone its clinical terminology to be used or not in that technology. And that's quite different to other states of Australia, um, for instance. Anyone comment on? Um, their experiences either using or trying to establish the use of standardised clinical terminologies in your setting? Uh, the stuff that I've been involved with, and I'm sure some of my colleagues could probably describe it a little bit better, um, is that we are slightly hampered by a US vendor's capability to, to adopt, um, you know, the, the tiered structure for standardised clinical terminology. So, so, for example, we use the SNOMED um, CT um, terminology within CERNA, but it's a very it's it's presented as a flat structure when, in fact, the whole design of that terminology is not that. So, um, we're we're definitely hampered by that. I, I think, sort of channeling what everyone's talking about, if if we could actually, we do need CERNA to improve on that. I'm sure even their their American. Um, clients would benefit from this too but it, it sort of takes that concerted user base effort to say look this isn't good enough we want it to be better yeah thanks robin to be fair to cerner i don't think some of the challenges are, are, are a cerner issue alone um there's a comment there from edmund um did, sorry did anybody else have any experience with clinical terminologies they wanted to reflect on Okay. Oh, I'll just, oh, I'll, Chris, I'll just say a couple of things now. You know, I mean, it's a huge topic. Obviously, there are already, as Chris alluded to, existing frameworks. Um, we've heard uh, about uh, from Robert. There's the SNOMED terminology. Most of you will be familiar with the International Classification of Diseases, which is, you know, version ten here in Australia, and we'll be going to eleven pretty soon. Um, different. So there's already some degree. And, and if you look at the medical textbook, um, the, the terminology is broad because we're trying to describe a pretty complex heterogeneous group of patients. And whilst, yes, there needs to be some standardization, what I would suggest, and maybe that standardization needs to occur at the back end from the point of view of data analysis and less at the front end um, uh, and, uh, you know, but uh, and then my other comment would be that goes all the way back to medical training and our role as clinical leaders is to teach um, doctors and clinicians um, in all walks to document clearly. And I suspect that us medical staff, we medical staff are probably the worst at it because what we do is we're, I'm the most senior person in the ward round, but I get the most junior person with the most le the least experience, the least understanding to do the documentation. Now, I might dictate it, but I'm relying on the less experienced person to actually do it. And I think that comes back to a bit of training um, in a you know, medical school. In. So it's a double-ended answer. Partly it's our fault. Um, but on the other hand, I reckon that um, behind the scenes with, um, um, with the technology that's available, um, uh, we ought to be uh, looking at standardised terminology at the back end for the data analytics side. Thanks. Yeah, yeah no, that, and that's a thought many have shared over a long time, Graham. I, it's interesting, your anecdote, I have distinctly uncomfortable memories of surgical rotations as an intern being asked to write the operative notes. It's like, oh, mate, <laughs> a bit tough. But um, uh, Stephen, you had a comment too. I just, uh, Rob and Graham both alluded to the challenges that we have with codified data sets like SNOMED and ICD-10, but um, 
a lot of what's entered into the EMR is uh, clinical notes in free text. And so any attempt to try and put any natural language processing on top of uh, text that's... So the, the, the problem with free text is that uh, you give someone the opportunity to put anything they like and they put anything they like, including various um, abbreviations and spelling errors and what have you. So it creates a, a, an extra challenge, particularly it's a it's a massive um, resource that's uh, fairly untapped at the moment. Thanks, Steve. All very true. Um, before I throw to Stephanie in a second, uh, I'm not sure the company still exists, but there's a company around when I was last dabbling in this space called Intelligent Medical Objects that took an interesting approach where their technology would sort of intercede at the data entry point with clinicians such that clinicians could use terminologies, sentences that made sense to them, but then were instantly mapped to codified schemes. Um, so they didn't have to pick necessarily from a drop down. They had some freedom to write things that made sense to them, but then it would flow through the system as the, then the chosen selection the clinician made, which I was was an interesting idea. Um, Stephanie. Um, just to the point about how we, it's a conversation I've had with um, a variety of people about how we actually teach um, documentation and particularly as we move to an electronic world in the hospitals in particular, because that's when our medical graduates are coming into this whole system really for the first time. I know, you know, we're still kind of actually like in, in the paper world, we, we looked at it as a skill that you develop as you develop as a clinician. And I don't think we've really changed that perspective at all, even though uh, tools have changed quite a bit. And down to the, you know, these are a lot of good questions to ask, you know, how much do, should we or do we um, teach med students or new graduates, you know, which things should you document as a pretext and which should you document? document as discrete data and what's why should you do that and, and embedding that value earlier on because I would also say I don't think everything should be discrete data you know there's still there's always been a, I'm sure a lot of people have had this conversation as well when implementing EMRs there's a concern from clinicians that you lose a lot of that narrative a lot of the meaning with the patient relationship if you just act as data monkeys and I think that's, that's an absolutely valid point but, um, and we've got a lot of way to go in terms of natural language processing and things like that, where we can extract the meaning um, out of documentation. But um, we don't, we don't really tend to teach people how to um, document their notes. And I remember you just pick it up. And I've done a lot of, um, as an example as well, it, it's, and it's not because they don't want to be taught. So I've done a lot of, um, you know, uh, orientation sessions for new coming, new starting doctors. And I've done sessions where I just teach them how to do discharge summaries. And when you get the feedback, they say the best session was where I learned how to write a discharge summary because no one's ever taught me that. And that's really enlightening, um, but it's an important question about how we, what we teach. That's a, it's an interesting segue to Stephanie. I noted you know, in everyone's talks, I made a comment about training. I hadn't been in, exposed really to the machinations of undergraduate healthcare training till I started working at the uni about five and a half years ago. Um, I guess to summarise, I would encourage the folks working in any healthcare care profession in industry who see this as an issue. How do we educate up and coming young pharmacists, doctors, nurses about this world they're working into, about to start working into? Um, please tell your institutions what you need. If you see a gap there, you think they're not being taught things, it needs to be demand driven. There are so many barriers to changing curriculum inside the universities, it's not funny. Is that good? No, but it's reality. So having uh, the people employing the staff coming down the pipeline ask for this is really important. Uh, Rob, sorry, I've kept you waiting a bit. Oh, that's all right. Um... So I just kind of further wanted to pick a thread that, um, that sort of running through a lot of that and um, particularly something Graham said that then um, Steph followed up with. 
Um, I think in a lot of organisations, people like Graham have a microphone and they can they can make noise about what they want to change. That's sort of my point around some people have political power and some don't. But it's probably those um, those junior medical staff that, that Graham's getting to do the documentation who have a better idea for what's wrong and how it needs to be um, improved or fixed. They're the people who need to describe what their problem is to people like me um, so that I you know, we can collaborate and work with them on how we can can make it better. So I guess the I'm sure Graham's not one of these, but you know, you want you want senior medical staff who can listen to their junior staff and and magnify their voice, I suppose, to say, well, yeah, like this isn't acceptable. We need to make this better so that it's easier for them to do their work and they don't need to come in at four o'clock in the morning to get all their stuff done, the documentation done before rounds. Okay. Very good point. Owen. You're still on mute, Alex. These are great questions and really um, good discussion points. The thing I would say is that um, one of the one of the challenges with implementing the EMR is that the view is that you need to get it all right and then implement it. And what that does is it holds many places back from actually implementing anything because they're not sure of the product and you know because you're committing to something. But what's really clear is that this is iterative and it will continue to evolve. You know, we learned handwriting at school. We learned cursive writing. There's now a push to remove cursing, cursive writing from the syllabus because it's not been shown to actually change performance later in your career. We learned typing. But in fact, most of these modules now that we're forcing people to type into are largely going to be replaced with, um, with, with you know, um, uh, language um, uh, to text um, technologies that are already existing is just a ma matter of how they're implemented. And as you said, the same thing with some of these um, forced uh, um, structured um, um, data, it's it's all going to be done in the back end very shortly. So we're in a we're in a transitional period. That shouldn't hold us back from continuing to do what we're doing, but we shouldn't fix to think of, think of ever that this is in a fixed space, that this is now where we've arrived and this is how we do things. We should constantly, and the biggest mistake that I've seen made at our own place and at others is that the team that's put brought in to implement is this big, and then there's a business as usual expectation that is which is is markedly reduced from the implementation, and it's almost ass about it. it it should be that the business as usual is actually massively supporting the ongoing iterative nature and evolution of but not only the organizational's version of the EMR, but in fact the 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 um technology that goes into the back end. And I think you're right that the this is a required painful generational change. It's it's a it's a it's a process that's going through. It's not a matter of getting it right and and delivering the perfect um implementation or the perfect um training it's actually a painful iterative generational change that we all have to just embrace and so it's really about generating a culture where it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to learn it's okay to ask questions it's okay to experiment it's okay to actually escalate concerns i mean the biggest problem that we've had is actually maintaining people people's ability to to keep questioning because if you ask a question five times and you always get no response or you get a no, you stop asking questions and then you get no capacity to improve the system that you're using. So if you can set up however you're doing, whatever you're doing, wherever you're doing, you can set up a way that always um, addresses people's questions with a sense that those questions are valued, even if they don't come with an answer that necessarily addresses the question at the point in time. Then, um, then you may just continue to have a culture that allows people to continually improve. Mm -hmm. When passionate people go silent, there's a problem um, completely. Um, just, just on that, you know, wanting to challenge and learn and go through organisational or maturity over time on this topic, um, it's a good segue for me to plug the fact that hopefully on May the 1st, so next week, we'll be releasing, this is myself and colleagues from a few academic institutions around Australia, the second national uh, EMR usability survey aimed at clinical users of all kinds. Um, you'll hopefully see that get fairly prominently shared around social media. So I encourage all the clinical users online to, to look out for that. 
this is benchmarked with a Finnish survey that's run over something like 12 years. Um, and this is our second one. So it's going to be interesting to see some comparative data from frontline users. Um, just a comment there on Edmund's question, because it's been sitting a while. Um, there is often the comment that there is a lack of standards. Um, is there a publicly available standards gap analysis for standards developing organisations available to address such needs? Um, I guess I'll try and have a quick bash at that, Edmund. Any standards, healthcare data standards type questions in Australia, I strongly encourage people to reach out to the Australian eHealth Research Centre. Um, David Hansen and his group have done marvellous work in this space. They have huge uh, knowledge about this. There's a quote that Rob probably has heard before, standards are wonderful, just pick which one you want to use. Um, that's part of the challenge here is what do we use and when do we use it. Um, I, I did have a little bit of involvement with national uh, health IT standards groups about 10 years ago. My understanding is there are a lot of stalwarts who spent a lot of time in this space in Australia and a lot of them have ended up somewhat disenfranchised. Irrespective uh, standards are really important. There are a lot out there to choose from and we need to leverage them as much as we can. Um, Hopefully that's addressed that reasonably, Edmund. Um, a question on that, sorry. Oh, sorry. So that Rob's just popped up a quick. Um, yeah, yeah, this is part of the challenge. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Owen, you and, and Steve, you use the term artisanal for your approach and your situation. And I've seen... Um, this idea of an embedded technical staff member with the unit, more in the sort of help desk functionality space than another institution. I guess the challenge is, Owen, how, how do you make that sustainable? How have you continued to advocate for Steve's role? Because we all know it's, it's hard when the rubber hits the road. So um, the biggest challenge I have is not losing Steve to everyone else who wants Steve. And I don't mean that just in terms of employment. I'm talking about his time and his and his mm. and his contribution. So we've had no end of people who've acknowledged that Steve's contribution is valuable. The, mm. the question is that everyone else asks is why don't we have a Steve? Why don't we, you know, why don't we have one of those? And it's very different. The model is just so fundamentally different to having a team that's removed from having an individual who's embedded. And, and, you know, Steve, if he needs something, can reach out either to the clinicians on the clinical side or, in fact, to the, the, the analysts and the, and the managers kind of outside. But, but to have Steve embedded is fundamentally different to any working environment that I've seen in health before. And I liken it to the transitional change that we're all making, you know, this generational change I talk about. We, we used to have... Um, physiotherapists and and occupational therapists and speech therapists and dietitians and and ward clerks and nurses and doctors all working in ICU and I would argue that now that must include data and analytics capability and since that doesn't exist in any of those clinicians that I've mentioned we have to have Steve and I think that's where we you know that's where we're fortunate that we've been able to make that argument work and we've demonstrated success with no question um the uh, the challenge is how organizations address that need because there's not enough steves but also that's a cost that's not factored in already and that's been true of all of the emr implementations we've seen everywhere you know i think um some of the big places in the us now 25 percent of their operating budget is spent on their on their on their e systems in Australia, I think we're looking somewhere between two and three percent usually, and so it's you know it hasn't recognised the act the absolute cost of of running a system that works, and so we've underinvested and we continue to do it. Something you said before that resonates with me is this painful generational change. Um, you know, as recently as five years ago, I was in an environment where people are trying to make a financial case for recouping every possible dollar against the cost of an EMR. And it gets to the point where they're making fanciful assumptions and 
and expectations just to make a spreadsheet line up. I think we need to get to a cultural point where we just say this is part of modernising healthcare services. There's a hump you need to get over and don't view it as something you can break even on because you can't, not in that immediate financial sense, um, would be my, my opinion too. Look, I'm really conscious of time. We're at 5.59. Um, I know that uh, people inevitably want to drift off. There's some of you still on site at places and you need you have wives and families and dinners to have. Uh, so, look, it's a pity we can't do what I often like to do in webinars and have everybody unmute their, their uh, audio and show their face and actually give people a round of applause they can hear. Just imagine that is happening. Uh, thank you very much to all our speakers today. I hope our audience really enjoyed that. Um, it's a really diverse range of skills and uh, capabilities represented here, and that's one of the things we've aimed for. So thank you very much to people from Eastern Health. I see you, to Owen, to Stephen and Graham. Thank you to Rob Dashwood from Monash Health. Thank you to Stephanie Wood from Alfred Health. And thank you to all our wonderful events and marketing team, Heather, Kashan, uh, Alexa and uh, Victoria and all involved. And um, we'll be having our next one of these sessions in about a month from now. And this will be more in the extended reality digital twin type space. So please keep an eye out for that as well. And as I mentioned before, if you're interested in helping us paint a picture of EMR usability in Australia, please keep a look out for that survey link that will come around. It's deliberately designed to be brief because we know the people we want to reply to it are, are very busy. So thank you again, everyone, and, and have, a, have a great night.